In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sirah Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, As-Siratul Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. Previously, we were studying about the beginning of the fourth year of Hijrah. The fourth year of the Prophet sallallahu residence in the city of Medina. And in the beginning of the fourth year, we talked about a couple of different um, incidents and campaigns that took place at that time. Um, and a lot of it seems to be uh, kind of a carryover effect from the Battle of Uhud and the outcome of the Battle of Uhud. So in the, similarly, right here in the beginning of the fourth year of Hijrah, in the month of Safar, which is the second month of the year. So this is kind of somewhat going on at the same time as the previous incidents that we talked about, which were um, Ghazwatul Rajia, um, there was the execution of the prisoners that were taken, there was the camp, the expedition of Amr bin Umayyah al damri so basically while all this is going on right here in the very beginning of the fourth year of Hijrah, there was one of the most tragic uh, events of the Medinan period. One of the most tragic events of the Medinan period was right here in the beginning of the fourth year of Hijrah. And that is that in the second month, in the month of Safar, these, and, and what's very fascinating is that, of course, all the books of Sirah, like Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, Waqidi, Ibn Kathir, and many, many others, all talk about this particular incident. But this incident is narrated in a lot of detail within the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. And so, many of the narrations that basically I'm going to be pulling a lot of the uh, incident and the story from, are coming from the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. So it mentions Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that someone had come from the, someone had come to Medina and requested the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to send uh, some individuals in order to be able to teach Islam and to be able to preach Islam and spread the message of Islam. So the, this request was presented before the Prophet ﷺ. And it more specifically um, talks about that the Prophet ﷺ had a little bit of hesitation even. So Abu Bara, Amr ibn Malik, who was called Mula'ib al-Asinna, which basically means the, the, like an expert of the swords, a man who plays with swords. And so he came to the Prophet ﷺ in the city of Medina, and the Prophet ﷺ called him to Islam, told him about Islam and told him to embrace and accept Islam. The man did not accept Islam. Amr bin Malik, Abu Bara, he did not accept Islam. However, at the same time, he, was, he seemed like he was intrigued. He didn't completely reject or refuse the proposal of accepting Islam either. So he said, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad ﷺ, لو بعت رجال من أصحابك إلى أهل نجد يدعونهم إلى أمرك رجوت أن يستجيبوا لك. He said, "Look, I'm still somewhat on the fence. I'm willing to consider this further. But if you could send a few people, if you could send some very good, knowledgeable, dedicated individuals, I will take them in the direction of Najd. And over there, if they were to come and preach on your behalf, I'm very optimistic that you would find a lot of people willing to believe." The Prophet ﷺ even told him, he said, إِنِّي أَخْشَى عَلَيْهِمْ أَهْلَ نَجْدِ I fear for them 
in regards to the people of Najd. Because I'm not sure if I can trust those individuals. So Abu Barad, this individual who came to recruit the Sahaba, he says, Ana lahum jarun. No worries, I will personally guarantee their safety. فَبَعَثَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ الْمُنْذِرِ بْنَ عَمْرِ الْمُنْذِرِ بْنَ عَمْرِ أَخَى بَنِي سَاعِدَ لِيَمُوتْ فِي أَرْبَعِينَ رَجُلًا مِنْ أَصْحَابِهِ مِنْ خِيَارِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فيهم الحارث بن سم صمة وحرام بن ملحان أخو بني عبد النجار وعروة بن أسماء بن صلت السلمي ونافع بن بوديل وعامر بن فهيرة مولى أبي بكر في رجال من خيار المسلمين. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم appointed al Munzir bin Amr and along with that some narrations mention that there were 40 individuals that were sent however some of the scholars of the sirah have given more credence and preference to the narr- narration that says that there were 70 individuals that were sent and they contain some very um some very extraordinary individuals and people some of their names i just read one of the interesting one of the most uh, very key individuals was amir bin fuhaira who was a freed slave of abu bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and he had also assisted the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and abu bakr when they were trying to make the migration when they were trying to perform the hijra so they they go with this individual abu bara and until they arrive at a place called bir mauna the well of Ma'una, Bir Ma'una, that was the name of the place. Um, and, وَهِيَ بَيْنَ أَرْضِ بَنِي عَامِرِ وَحَرَّةِ بْنِ سُلَيْمِ And it was kind of in between the territories, uh, governed and run by two different tribes. So, when they stopped there, now, another thing is that these Sahaba, uh, Imam Bukhari rahmahullah ta'ala, the very first uh, narration that he brings in regards to this particular incident of Bir Ma'una, the first thing that he mentions is that بَعَثَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ سَبْعِينَ رَجُلًا لِحَاجَةٍ يُقَالُ لَهُمْ الْقُرَّاءِ That the Prophet ﷺ sent 70 individuals who used to be called Al-Qurra' Now Al-Qurra' normally means reciters of the Qur'an but it wasn't, they weren't Qurra how we interpret that word. They weren't just simple, simple reciters of the Qur'an or people with just nice voices. Qurra meant that they were dedicated students of the Qur'an. Right? The Sahabas, uh, the, 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 the understanding and the paradigm of the Sahaba when it came to the Qur'an was very different than ours. We call somebody an expert with the Qur'an if somebody recites with a nice voice. Or somebody can memorize, you know, a certain amount of... Uh, portions of uh, Zav the Quran. However, in the in the understanding of the Sahaba, which they learned from the Prophet ﷺ, uh, a true Qari, a true reciter of the Quran, was somebody who not only recited it, not only someone who uh, would uh, memorize it, but this was also somebody who would study it, understand it, live by it, preach and call to it. Like somebody who lived the life of the Qur'an, sahib al-Qur'an, somebody who was dedicated to the Qur'an. So this is how they're described. So these were not just, you know, any sahabi is of course a very remarkable individual, because he's a student of the Messenger wasallam. But amongst the students, the sahaba, these were 70 individuals who were now being utilized by the Prophet wasallam to teach others the Qur'an. So they were like the teaching assistants of the Prophet ﷺ when it came to teaching the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it should tell you about their status and their level. And the Prophet ﷺ sele- selected them. He hand chose them to go, to be able to go and teach and preach the message over there. And the reality of these individuals, to kind of better understand them and exactly what happened and transpired, the reality of these individuals was that majority of them, or a lot of them, were from whom we call the Ashabu Sufa. And the Ashabu Sufa were people who were so devoted and dedicated to the study of the Qur'an and the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they wouldn't even preoccupy themselves with work or business. And so they were people of very meager, humble means. And due to that fact, they used to stay within the masjid. They used to live within the masjid, they would eat whatever would be brought for them, and they would spend day and night reading and learning the book of Allah, and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and they were very dedicated, full-time students of the Prophet ﷺ. So, because of that now, they didn't necessarily have a lot of 
you know, uh, financial means and provisions. So what it mentions about them is Zakanu Yahta Tribuna bin Nahari wa Yasaluna Billay. That as they were traveling, what they would do is during the daytime, so they would make periodic stops, like maybe every three days or every five days or every so many so on and so forth. After a certain amount of time, they would make a stop on their journey, they would set camp, they would spend the day collecting you know wood in the area. Like they would, you know, chop up firewood and things like that, and then they would sell that in that area to the people who lived in that region. Right, so they would spend the day while they are traveling. They would stop. They would go. They would collect wood and firewood and chop it up and prepare it for sale. And then they would take it into the nearby town or village, and they would sell it there. And then after selling it, that little bit of money that they were able to acquire, that would now hold them over for the next couple of days. And this is a very interesting, um, you know, a very actually powerful uh, lesson that we need to really understand and learn. So let's kind of put the pieces together real here. I want to pause real quickly and I want to put the pieces together just so we understand exactly what we're learning. These are individuals who have dedicated themselves full time to the study of the deen. And they don't have any expectations in regards to that. They're not looking for somebody to give them a stipend. They're not looking for somebody to support them. They're not looking for somebody to set them up nicely. They understand that if I'm studying the deen, I'm not doing anyone any favors. Of course, the community should always understand the, the value of such individuals who will study the deen because they can come back and serve the community. But those individuals themselves who study the deen, they need to understand that they're not doing anyone any favor. They need to operate with that mindset. And that entitlement is something that has not only plagued a lot of students of knowledge in our day and age, but it's something that has really gotten quite out of hand. Where, you know, and, and this is probably due to the fact that we overall are products of a culture and a society that breeds entitlement within us and self-delusions within us. But there's just this mindset has become very, very common and predominant where if I'm doing something for the deen then, or I'm studying the religion, then I am somehow doing the entire world a favor. And therefore, everyone needs to help me. Everyone needs to facilitate this for me. Everyone needs to take care of me. Everyone needs to respect me. You can start to see the problem that's starting to you know, build up over here. That this, this mindset and this attitude that is being developed is completely antithetical to what that individual is studying. You're, studi you're learning, you're supposed to be learning to submit to Allah and to follow in the footsteps, like almost as a servant, to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet wasallam. You're learning to be humble, and, and to consider it your, you're supposed to be learning to be humble and consider it your honor and blessing to be able to do something for the deen of Allah in any capacity. But instead it's cultivating completely the opposite mindset. And that's very, very problematic. Now we're not done yet with these individuals. This is why we studied the life of the Prophet wasallam. by the way. This is exactly the reason why. So those are those individuals. They sleep in the masjid, they don't have, they don't have a home. They sleep in the masjid, they eat whatever somebody you know, can bring or some leftovers from somebody's house. They'll eat whatever they can get their hands on just in order to be able to survive. And why? Because I'm trying to learn the deen of Allah. On top of all of that, now the Prophet ﷺ calls on them. And he calls on them and he says that I need you to leave here now and travel far away, and go all the way out there, and teach and preach the religion of Islam to the people that you come across. Right? You're being sent out on this noble, divinely ordained, prophetically inspired mission. Again, right? As crazy as it seems, or it sounds, 
that the individual should be honored by this. That the individual should be honored by this. And should feel extremely, um, you know, blessed and honored. That I am being allowed to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such an amazing and profound capacity. I get to be a part of something so special. Now here again, let's observe the mindset. So they are so honored and privileged to be able to learn and study the deen, the religion, that what do they do? They set out, they don't bring to anyone's attention, they don't go and complain, oh, but you know, I don't have this, or I don't have that, and I don't got this type of money, I don't have this type of food, and supplies, and... No, no, no. Absolutely. I would love to go. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. And they set out. Reality sets in, and in two, three days, they don't have anything to eat. So what do they do? This is where it's... It, it would seem bizarre to us that they who have been sent by the Prophet ﷺ to go preach Islam, they stop in the middle of their journey, they roll up their sleeves, they head out into the woods, they chop down trees, they cut the pieces up, manual labor, they produce like logs, firewood, and then they strap it onto their backs, they carry it over into the next town, the next village, they set up shop over there and they sell it, and get very, just, you know, again, how much are you going to be able to sell firewood for? You're basically just charging for the convenience of chopping it down and bringing it to them. It's a natural resource. So, they're not able to make a lot of money, they're able to make a little bit of money, and they take that little bit of money, and they buy enough food to hold them over for the next couple of days, and then they set out again. And again, when they run out of food, then they get back to manual labor and work. Now compare that with, again, the very problematic mindset that has become all too common in our times. Right? Where again, I talked about the being the student of knowledge aspect of it, but now if we're told, if we're asked, if we're requested to do something for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now we're waiting for, you know, the welcome wagon. We're waiting for all the big fuss and the hoopla and the red carpet and the, all the you know, fancy setup. Now again, I reiterate here, the community should always value people who serve the deen. I'm not trying to say that the community should have like this absurd mindset, by no means. But I'm more so talking about those of us who might find ourselves in the position of where we're being called on. That we should consider it so much of our own privilege and blessing to be able to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way. That if I have to use my own time, my own dime, if I have to use my own money, and I have to take care of myself, and I have to even end up investing something into this, what an absolute honor and pleasure. But at the very least, the entitlement that we are plagued with, that needs to be remedied. And that's something we learned directly from the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, where they felt it to be their honor. And above everything else, the third part of this, وَيُسَلُّونَ بِاللَّيْلِ That while they, they are traveling, they are travelers, they're on a journey, they stop, they work all day long to be able to just get enough food to survive for the next couple of days. But at night... They still stand up and they pray. And they still wake up in the night and they offer prayers. And read the Qur'an and make dua. Like there's no excuses being made here. Because they understand, I'm not doing anyone any favors. Because if you really start going through this process logically, if I'm acting like I'm doing someone a favor, if I'm acting like I'm some huge gift of God to humanity, then let's logically go through the process. Who am I doing a favor? Would anyone dare ever claim they're doing Allah a favor? No. Doing the deen of Allah a favor? Absolutely not. Doing the community a favor? Then again, who has guaranteed, who's, who has basically taken responsibility of providing guidance? Allah. So you're not even doing the community a favor. Do you consider yourself irreplaceable? 
Because then that would still necessitate the fact that you're somehow behaving in a manner that says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala couldn't find anyone else to do this. And that's still problematic. So you end up with the final conclusion, I'm not doing anyone any favors except myself. So then where is this type of mindset and this attitude and this conduct coming from? Right, so this is something very powerful that I wanted to point out here about this particular uh, campaign. Um, so, going back to where we were talking about, so this is the manner in which they're traveling. So they travel until they arrive at the place of Birmauna. When they arrive there, there is an individual in that particular area. His name is Amir bin At-Tufail. Amir bin At-Tufail. Amir bin At-Tufail, Amir ibn At-Tufail, he is a very nefarious individual. Aside from what we're going to read about what he ended up doing over here, there's another uh, interaction that this individual had with the Prophet wasallam as well, that kind of tells you about how problematic this particular man was. And that was that he had actually come before to meet with the Prophet wasallam, And he, when he met the Prophet wasallam, he told the Prophet wasallam that, I am going to give you three options. He tells the Prophet wasallam, I'm going to give you three options. Number one, is that يَكُونُ لَكَ أَهْلُ السَّهْلِ وَلِيَا أَهْلُ الْمَدَرِ That you will preach to the people of, you know, the, the, the Bedouins, and I will run the cities. You go out there and you can deal with the Bedouins, but I will run the cities. That will be my territory. Right, so as if he's trying to broker a deal with the Prophet ﷺ. He says number two, O أَكُونَ O أَكُونُ خَلِيفَتَك or number two is that fine, you preach your religion and you let it go as far as it goes and spread as far as it spreads. But after you are done, like whenever you die, I will become your successor. You will proclaim and you know, uh, make this proclamation before your death that I will succeed you as the king and the ruler of Arabia. Number three is or... I will go and raise an army of a hundred thousand men from Ahlu Ghatfan, which was Ta'if in that particular region. I will raise an army, I will build an army of a hundred thousand men and then come and fight you. One day, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but I'm going to be working on building an army and I will come and I will fight you and I will defeat you. He had said this to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ told him, you need to go now. And so this individual did not have a very good history with the Prophet ﷺ and with the Muslims. He was not far from that region where they had stopped, Bir Ma'una. He wasn't far from there. So Haram ibn Milhan, who was a Sahabi who was a part of this group, one of the notable people in this group, they, they wrote a letter basically, uh, or they had a letter from the Prophet ﷺ calling you know, him to Islam. And they went to go deliver that letter they sent him to go deliver that letter to him. So when Haram ibn Milhan, radiallahu anhu, the Sahabi, takes the letter of the Prophet ﷺ, he takes it to this man Amir, to deliver it to him, that the Messenger ﷺ has written you a letter, trying to talk some sense into you. لَمْ يَنْظُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ حَتَّى عَدَى عَلَى الرَّجُلِ فَقَتَلَهُ He didn't even open the letter. He took the letter from his hand and then stabbed Haram radiallahu ta'ala anhu and on the spot and killed him. He didn't even read the letter. He took the letter in one hand and he stabbed him with the other hand. Finished him off on the spot. Then he called out to his people, Bani Amir, and he said, come with me and we will go and slaughter all these Muslims that have come in our area. Let's go and finish him off. By the way, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu were not combatants. They were going on a basically like a peaceful missionary type, you know, uh, journey. So they were there as missionaries. They were there as preachers. And so he's saying, let's go and slaughter all of them. Let's go and massacre them. His own people turned him down. And they said, لَنُخْفِرَ أَبَابَرَا 
They said, no, Abu Bara, remember the man who had come to Medina and not become Muslim? But he wasn't a bad person. He had not become Muslim. And he had told the Prophet ﷺ, send some people with me. They said, no, Abu Bara gave them protection. We will not violate the protection of Abu Bara. So he says, okay. So he goes over to the nearby tribes, the people of Banu Sulaim, whose names the, the, the tribes or the, the families within the tribe are Usayya, Ri'al, Dhaqwan, and Qara. There were four families within the tribe of Banu Sulaim. They were Usayya, Ri'alan, Dhaqwan, and Qara. He goes to this particular tribe and he says, why don't you come with me and we will massacre the people of Muhammad wasallam." And they agreed to go with him. So they go and they ambush the Sahaba, about 70 companions. They completely surround them, they ambush them. And when they realize that they're surrounded, they basically try to do whatever they can in order to defend themselves. حَتَّى قُتِلُوا عَنْ آخِرِهِمْ But each and every single one of them was killed. They literally massacred them. The only survivor on the spot who was present there, so there were about 70 people that were there. One of them was a messenger who was killed by this man Amir as soon as he delivered the letter of the messenger wasallam. There were two more individuals that I'll talk about in just a minute who were sent by the group to go and graze some of their animals. So they were sent out to graze the animals. So they were a little bit far away. Amongst the remaining people, however many, they must have been 67, 60 some odd, whatever. All of them were massacred. Only one of them survived. His name was Ka'ab ibn Zayd. And the reason why he survived, he was injured. وَبِهِ رُنْقُمْ He was stabbed, he was injured. But he was buried under some of the bodies of his companions. So basically he was stabbed, he fell, and then more of the sahaba were killed, and their bodies fell on top of him in such a way, and he was unconscious when he fell, that they just thought that he was dead just like the rest of them. He woke up a little while later to find himself buried amongst the bodies of his companions. So he was the only one who survived on the spot. He would eventually go back, somehow limp back to Medina, arrived there at the Prophet ﷺ, informed the Prophet ﷺ what happened. And in the following year, which we'll, we will learn about inshallah soon enough, and that is the battle of Khandaq, the battle of the trench, he was shaheed in that particular battle. And so that's what happened over here at this particular spot. There were two, as I mentioned, who had been sent by... Um, there were two who had been sent to go and take the animals for grazing. One of them was Amr bin Umayyah, who we talked about in the previous campaign, and another man from the Ansar, whose name is not noted. The two of them, they, they, they talk about it, that they were over there, you know, grazing the animals, and one of them, they have no idea of what's going on. They were so far away, they couldn't hear anything, they couldn't see anything. One of them looks over there and he says, إِلَّا طَيْرُ تَحُمُّ حَوْلَ الْعَسْكَرِ He sees scavenger birds starting to circle around the area where their camp was set up. And it's such a huge amount of these scavenger birds that are starting to circle around and congregate there that he said, that looks like something bad. That's something really bad. So they both run back. فَإِذَا الْقَوْمُ فِي دِمَائِهِمْ They run back but they find all of their companions dead, soaked, soaked completely in their own blood. And the, the people who had attacked them were not, still not too far away. So the Ansari, the Ansari, Amr bin Umayyah, he says, we should go run back to Medina and go tell the Prophet ﷺ what happened and what transpired. The Ansari says, So the Ansari says, No, such amazing individuals, men who are much, much better than me, have fallen at this particular spot. I will not be able to live with myself if I leave here like this. So he runs at the people who had basically killed everybody 
and attacks them. And of course, you know, very unfortunately and tragically, he's also shaheed. He's also killed. Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri, he's captured and taken prisoner. He is delivered to that man who had set up this entire thing, Amir bin At-Tufail. He's delivered to him. Amir bin At-Tufail finds out that this man, uh, Amr bin Umayyah, the Sahabi who has been captured, he finds out that he belongs to um, a tribe that he has some relationship with. So he finds out that he belongs to a tribe that he has some type of a relationship with. So what he does, he does something very bizarre, but I guess it was a part of their superstition and culture at that time. He shaves his head. He shaves his head to basically make him look like a slave, because um, that's what they would do to the slaves at that time. They would shave, they would make the, they would keep the heads of the slaves shaven. They would shave their heads. And so he shaves his head and then he releases him. And he says that, I had made a promise to my mother that I would free a slave. So let you go ahead and be that slave that I'm freeing on behalf of the promise that I had made to my mother. And so Amr bin Umayyah, he says, okay, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on with you, but good enough for me. And so Amr bin Umayyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he leaves there. And he's making his way back to Medina. Now, by this time, you know, this is a very tragic situation. We talked about 70 preachers, students of the Qur'an, of the Prophet ﷺ, have come here to preach. They are all massacred. One of them who was injured but seemed like he was dead, gets up and makes it back to Medina. But before he even makes it back to Medina, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ receives the news via you know, revelation and from Jibreel alayhi salam that he says to the sahaba, inna ashabakum qad usibu. Inna ashabakum qad usibu. Your companions, your friends have been killed. Wa innahum qad sa'alu rabbahum. But they made dua to their, to their master Allah. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا أَخْبِرَ عَنَّا إِخْوَانَنَا بِمَا رَضِيْنَا عَنْكَ وَرَضِيْتَ عَنَّا فَأَخْبَرَهُمْ عَنْهُمْ But he says that your friends have been killed. But they asked their master Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, please inform our brothers not only what happened with us, but also please inform our brothers and let our brothers know that, Oh Allah, we are pleased with you and you are pleased with us. And so the Prophet ﷺ informed the Sahaba that this is a message, the last dua that comes to you from your brothers who were massacred viciously and terribly. And <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ also tells uh, the Sahaba about one specific Sahabi, Amir bin Fuhayra, who I talked about earlier. He was a freed slave of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he had assisted the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr in the journey of the Hijrah. He was considered a very high-ranking, special Sahabi, even amongst themselves in their community. So some narrations mentioned that somebody specifically asked about him, and some narrations mentioned the Prophet ﷺ told them that when uh, Amir bin Fuhayra, he was stabbed. He was stabbed by someone in the back. When this whole massacre was going on, he was stabbed by someone in the back. And when the narration says that he reaches back to his wound, and his hand is soaked with blood, he takes that blood and he puts it on his head, marks his head with that blood, and he says, Fuztu wa Rabbil Kaaba. I have succeeded. I swear by Allah I am successful. That I have been killed for the sake of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I have lost my life preaching and calling people towards the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and towards the book of Allah. And he says, by Allah I am successful. And a little bit of an interesting thing, the reason why he takes that blood and he stains himself with that blood is because we know about the shuhada when they will be raised on the day of resurrection. They will be raised with their wounds and with the blood still on them. So he was putting that blood on his head so that it will be visible on the day of judgment. That it will be a source of honor. That I gave my life for the deen of Allah. So he reaches back and he puts that blood on his head and he says, Fuztu Rabbil Kaaba. Something very interesting happens. The individual 
who stabbed him, his name was Jabbar. His name was Jabbar. He asked someone afterwards that, hey, I, I have a question. The question I have is, the man, one of, the, one of these Muslims, one of these people of Muhammad wasallam, who when we were massacring them, I stabbed him. And when I stabbed him, he said, Fuzdu. He understood what Rabbil Kaaba that he's, ta- he's taking a, an oath, he was swearing by God. I get that part, but he said, Fuzdu, which is the Arabic verb for, I have succeeded. I have attained success. I have passed. He says, I don't, ما معنى قوله فزتو? Well, what does that mean? I don't understand. So somebody told him, يعني بالجنة. He's saying that he attained paradise. He was so affected by that. He said, صدق والله. He said, you know, there's something to what this man is saying. And it really struck him and it hit him. It almost like, like we say, you know, it haunted him. And the narration mentions, Waqidi brings this particular narration, that after some time, Jabbar would become Muslim because of this. He would become Muslim and then he would tell the story. Let me tell you how I became Muslim. Right, so very, very interesting. After he stabbed him, in the book of the Maghazi of Musa bin Uqba, it says, Amir bin Fuhayra, you know, Amir bin Atufail, the evil man who had orchestrated this massacre, he wanted to desecrate the body of Amir bin Fuhayra. He wanted to mutilate the body of Amir bin Fuhayra. Why? Because he was going around the battlefield asking, Aina Mawla Abi Bakr? Where is the freed slave of Abu Bakr? Because in, in, in the Sahaba, at the time of the Sahaba, when, you, when somebody freed a slave like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu did in the case of Bilal radiallahu anhu and Ahmed bin Fuhayra and many others, when, when these sahaba, they freed a slave, that person basically would become a part of the family. They would like adopt that person into the family and help that person get on their feet and figure out how to live life. So they would become a very close member of the family. And that's why Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was able to trust him in assisting him and the Prophet sallallahu while they were trying to travel, migrate from Mecca to Medina, even though there was, everyone was looking for them. So this evil man, Amr bin At-Tufayl, wanting to further you know, in, insult the Prophet sallallahu by insulting Abu Bakr because he knows Abu Bakr means a lot to the Prophet sallallahu He goes around the, 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 the area after the massacre, Aina Mawla Abi Bakr. I've heard that the freed slave of Abu Bakr, like an extended family member of Abu Bakr is here. Where is he? And some of the narrations mention that he couldn't find his body anywhere. He couldn't find his body. And then some of the narrations mentioned that when he looked up, he saw that his body was lifted up and raised up into the sky by the angels to protect his body from being mutilated by this man. And the angels were protecting his body up in the sky. Keeping his body out of the grasp of this evil man. Like such miraculous things. So, as I was mentioning before, after all of this happened, you know, the one injured man makes it back to Medina. The two people who had gone to graze the animals, one of them is also killed. Amr bin Umayyah al-Damri is captured, but then very strangely, you know, he's almost, uh, his head is shaved and he's freed as like some type of weird superstitious practice of that man Amr bin At-Tufayl. So now he starts going back to, he starts making his way back to Medina. Now something very, very interesting happens here. What happens over here is as Amr ibn Umayyah al-Damri is making his way back to Medina, he stops at a place where a lot of travelers would stop. You know, there's like a big tree, there's a little bit of water in the area, like a rest area, right? A watering hole. He stops there, he goes and he sits down under the shade of the tree. There are two other men sitting by the shade of the tree. Now, Amr bin Umayyah, you can imagine, he six, you know, like 68 of his friends, he just saw them massacred. Right? And, and so you can imagine how shaken up he is, how scared he is, how kind of, you know, almost like there's traumatized he is. So maybe there's a little level of paranoia even. 
So he's sitting there and he can't help but notice these two guys sitting there as well. And he's kind of worried. I wonder if, they, if they're from them and if they're looking for me, if they're going to try to grab me, right? He's, he's traumatized. So he asks them, Mimman and Tuma, where are y'all from? And they said, Mim Bani Amir. We are from Banu Amir. Banu Amir is the tribe of that man who orchestrated the massacre. He, they say we are from that tribe. They don't mention him, but they say that's the tribe that we belong to. So, Amr bin Umayyah, you know, imagine again, like I talked about what his condition is right now, how traumatized he is. So he just sits down quietly, he says, oh, okay, that's nice. He just sits down quietly, and he waits. And both of them, they're travelers, so they fall asleep. They lay down and they fall asleep. As soon as they fall asleep, he jumps up and he kills both of them in their sleep. Because he's just... He's worried, right? He's, he's traumatized. He just saw 68 of his friends get massacred. So, he, he goes back to Medina. He makes his way back to Medina. When he gets back to Medina, he tells the Prophet ﷺ what happened. Not only what happened in the massacre, but then he also, and this shows the honesty and the forthcomingness of the Sahaba, that he tells the Prophet ﷺ, the local messenger of God, I'm not sure right or wrong, but I was, I was on edge, my nerves were fried. I had just been through such a traumatic experience. And I met two people from that same tribe of that man who did this to us. And I just stabbed and killed both of them in their sleep. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَقَدْ قَتَلْتَ قَتِيلَيْنَ You should not have killed those two men. You should not have killed those two men. First of all, those two men didn't do anything to you, number one. Number two, they are not even a part of that man's plan. Because if you go back to the story, you remember that man, the evil man Amir bin At-Tufayl, when he kills the messenger who brings a letter of the Prophet ﷺ, and he tells his tribe, let's go and kill all these people of Muhammad ﷺ, what do his own people say? They say, no, no, no. No, no, no. We're not a part of this. We're not doing this. He go, ends up going and recruiting people from another tribe. So the Prophet ﷺ says, he acted of his own accord. See, this is the justice and the fairness of the Prophet ﷺ. I bring this up almost, it seems, you know, very, very regularly, and, uh, you know, time and time again. But for all the accusations and all the distortion of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, where people want to try to paint a picture of as if like the Prophet ﷺ of the Sahaba, وَالْعَيَاذُ billah were bloodthirsty, just going around massacring people and killing people and picking fights. The Prophet ﷺ very easily could have said, fine, they belong to his tribe, so what? Collective guilt. But the Prophet ﷺ is not that. The Prophet ﷺ is here to establish order and justice. Stand for what is right as witnesses before God. Because if you play around with justice, you still have to answer to Allah. So stand for justice knowing that you have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ says, no, 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 no. His tribe did not take place in the massacre. This is the, this is the conduct, this, these are the actions of an individual. So we are not going to hold the whole tribe accountable. We're not going to go there and start killing people from that tribe. That's not how we operate. And so the Prophet ﷺ goes as far as saying, لَأَدِيَنَّهُمَا um, The Prophet ﷺ says that I will pay retribution to the families of those two individuals. And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ reaches out to the tribe, says two of your individuals were wrongly and accidentally, because of the circumstances and the trauma, they were wrongly and accidentally killed by one of my people. I would like to offer my condolences, my apologies, and I would also like to make amends. And then the Prophet ﷺ ends up paying the, the, what's called the blood money, the diya. He ends up paying that to the family of those two individuals. <clears throat> And then the Prophet ﷺ even said, هَذَا عَمَلُوا أَبِي بَرَاء That if I am upset with anyone, aside from Amir bin At-Tufayl, the man who did that, he's just an evil, terrible human being. But if there is anybody else I blame, I blame Abu Bara, the man who had come and recruited the Sahaba. He said, وَقَدْ كُنْتُ لِهَذَا كَارِهًا مُتَخَوِّفًا the Prophet ﷺ said, I was afraid that this was gonna happen. And that's why I displayed the hesitation that I did. 
And the Prophet ﷺ was so devastated and so hurt um, at this incident and at the loss of these individuals that Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that the Prophet ﷺ for an entire month, every single day, in the prayer of Salat al-Fajr, the Prophet ﷺ offered dua. What we call qunut al-nazila. Qunut al-nazila, which is a special dua that is made at the time of a great tragedy. And he did that for an entire month. وَذَلِكَ بَدُوا الْقُنُوتِ Imam Bukhari brings his narration. From Imam, uh, Imam Bukhari brings his narration saying that this was the very first time that this qunut nazila was established and was practiced. وَمَا كُنَّا نَقْنُوتُ And Anas ibn Malik says, before that we had never done the qunut nazila dua or prayer, but this was the first time that it was installed and it was enacted. And for an entire month the Prophet ﷺ prayed. Not only for the, the, those sahaba who had been massacred and their families, but he also prayed for divine retribution against the people who had massacred them. And so this concludes the incident of Bir Ma'una, um, a very great tragic incident and loss during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ in the Medinan period, uh, in the beginning of the fourth year uh, of Hijrah. And inshallah we're going to go ahead and pause here, and inshallah we'll continue on from here by talking about the incident of Banu Nadir in the next uh, session inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashad wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiraku wa natubu ilayk.